I'm living in Poland, in Wroclaw. I am organizing here uh, Angular meetups, and I'm a big fan of performance, CSS, experiments, such kinds of things. You can follow me on Twitter. You can read my blog. I have a bunch of uh, posts about some CSS experiments with Houdini and such kind of things, web audio as well. So what actually does it mean web awesome, uh, assembly driven CSS? What is the concept behind it? So here's some demo. It's uh, Conway's game of life. Uh, it's rendered using Houdini CSS Paint API. And the state of this animation is driven by WebAssembly. Uh, also, I'm using custom properties to update grid colors and actually pass data to the renderer. And it's alive. And yeah, here you can see I'm loading WebAssembly module and it updates the state of the animation. And the animation itself is pretty performant, so I use not that much time for rendering at each frame. And the main th thread uh, JavaScript used only to request updates and pass data through the, to the renderer. And you should say something like, wow. <laughs> it's a huge field of experiments and uh, allows us to make something interesting that will not affect main thread in which we can run our Angular or React application with a lot of business logic, but we're still able to add something fancy and run it out of the main thread. So how it looks like? this kind of concept that I want to describe. So we have a pure renderer, Houdini Paint Worklet. We will speak about each of these parts in details later. Now it's just a concept overview itself. So it's the renderer, it's stateless, and it renders our animation to the screen for the user. It's a view layer. And the main thread, we have some glue JavaScript code that uh, loads our paint worklet and updates properties. Those properties are passed to the paint uh, worklet. So it's kind of container or controller that just pass properties and we uh, trigger a new render. On WebAssembly module, we have some state manager. And from the main JavaScript code, we just loading this module and requesting the updates of our state. So posting message, WebAssembly doing a hard job probably, and it returns us an updated state that then passes to the properties and to paint worklet. And you might notice that it's something really similar that we already had uh, in the past for front end. For example, MVC pattern or Redux, where we have view, pure components, we have our container component, and we have Redux store for state management. So pretty similar concept that uh, separates all jobs between uh, proper modules. <coughs> so let's start to speak about each of these parts in more details. So first one is Houdini Paint API. Uh, just a few words about Houdini. It's the project that uh, gather all the APIs that allow you to have more deep access to the CSS itself. Now we are limited to, to add new features to CSS with JavaScript. But it's probably wrong because we update them on wrong stage. First of all, we build in our DOM, then CSS DOM, then we load JavaScript and parse it, and then from JavaScript we can update again CSS and re-trigger all these processes. So probably it's not the best way of doing that. And that is why we have a lot of problems with polyfilling new CSS features with JavaScript. 
So what is paint API workload? It's actually an API that allows you to draw a canvas image for every property that accepts images, like background image, like border image, list style image, or custom property of type of image. OK, how we can create one? First of all, we need to create a, a class in separate file uh, to and define our special paint class that should follow the interface. Then in the main thread, we load in this module, so then we will be allowed to use it. After that, in CSS, we can use paint function for background image, for example, and pass the name of our worklet. It's just high-level definition of how stuff should be done. And let's go deeper. So in a separate file, we create in some class. Let's call it painter. And it should have at least one method, paint. This method is accepting context, geometry, properties, and arguments. So context is a basic 2D canvas context with some limitations. Uh, for example, you are not allowed to uh, render text with it, at least for now. Geometry is the object that contains widths and heights of the element we apply in our uh, function. So it's actual dimensions of element. And the most in interesting thing that if the element size will be changed, uh, paint API will trigger paint function, new render for us. Next one is properties. We can subscribe to uh, properties we want to listen. And if any of these properties will be updated, again, paint API trigger render for us. Uh, and those properties could be just standard CSS properties like color, padding, margin, whatever, or custom properties or CSS variables. And the last one, still very experimental feature, input arguments. And it's pretty similar to properties, but instead of have some variables on top of our CSS file, we will just pass arguments to the paint function after the name of painter. And instead of subscribing to some properties, we pass in the list of types, actual CSS types. Uh, we will speak about them slightly later, but in general, uh, CSS engines under the hood, they already have types for all CSS properties and descriptors for them. And with Houdini, we are allowed to use them as well. So after we define our class, we should register it, uh, give it a name, like my painter, and pass class uh, symbol. OK. Then in the main thread, we're going to load this module. So we can check if uh, we have that functionality right now in browser, like paint worklet in CSS. And then we are calling special function, add module, and passing the pass to our painter file. The reason why uh, this paint worklet should be written in a separate file, that is uh, paint API has its own separated JavaScript context. And this allows. Uh, in, uh, engineers who, do, who working on uh, browser engines to optionally decide where, if they want to run this render on separate thread. So it's not obligatory to run it in separate thread, but if uh, engine will decide, it could be run on separate thread. That should improve our uh, performance and give us time for uh, another work like normal application. Optionally, we can pass some fallback values. OK, how it looks like in CSS. So we have standard uh, CSS declaration. We define in some background. And this background uh, color, I mean solid one that comes first, will be used as a fallback. Because as any CSS property, if it's not supported, browser just will ignore it and we'll use previous one. So 
and on the next line, we are calling paint function. And inside this function, we just pass the name of our paint worklet that we just created. OK. Next step, we can, could use some properties that we are listening for. So we can define custom property or use just CSS property. And when the value of this property changes, uh, Paint API will re-render our image. And the last one example is the arguments. So we listening to some, uh, we declaring what types of arguments we are accepting and how much. And we are passing them into our function as uh, arguments. And actually, it looks better from perspective of CSS like traditions because we have functions like linear gradients where we pass in a bunch of arguments instead of using some additional properties. OK, how it looks like? Here's a few examples. For example, star rating. So for background of this uh, bl uh, block with stars, we using just Painter, and that's it. And this slider is just updating CSS properties, like how many ratings should we get, how many corners of a star we want, and such kind of things. Pretty interesting, and the most nice feature is that it's quite reusable. We can declare JavaScript module that will load Painter, and then we are allowed to use this custom function in any project we want. Another quite interesting and more useful example is QR code generation. So we pass in a string and few parameters to the paint workless through custom properties, and we generate in real QR code. And it's, it, this one should work, so you can check it. It should link to CSS Mint.js website. OK, what benefits do we get? It, uh, first of all, it is possible that our custom renderer will be run on separate browser thread. Another one, we can draw whatever we want using Canvas API, almost complete one, except 3D, WebGL, and uh, text for now. And the renderer will be triggered only when it's actually needed, if the element size will change or any argument or property we are interested in. OK. Another benefit, I'm personally using the Paint API on production for my blog. It's a material kind of background, so some blocks with shadows. And I have a painter one built with this canvas. So it's shadows and rectangles, and one views a image for a photo back. Yeah? So what benefits I get here? So for Paint API, minified JavaScript, CSS, and JavaScript to load module, it's something about 800 bytes. For image, compressed GPG and cropped for mobile only, so the smallest one I have, it, should, it will take two kilobytes. So actually, we can benefit in network uh, data as well. Of course, we can't compare directly JavaScript code with images, because uh, the trade-off of JavaScript is that it needs to be parsed and run with uh, some JavaScript machine. So actually, it's uh, less energy efficient, let's say. But on the other side, we benefit with size. OK, next interesting thing. I want to show some JS and CSS stuff. It's not CSS and JS, it's JS and CSS. So here are some example. I have charts. And on hover, I'm switching data sets for this chart. It's also configurable, like which site I want these bars, on how many gap I want, and such kind of things. But the data I pass in inside is just JSON. So I have a custom property with a JSON value. I'm passing it to the worklet. It parses it using JSON parse. And uh, according to this data, renders my chart. The only thing is that uh, if you will use such kind of chart, you need to think 
for additional accessibility. So you need somehow describe this chart, but it's completely another topic. Another interesting example. Uh, this is JS and CSS example where the custom property used to actual, actually pass JavaScript inside Paint Worklet. So Paint Worklet for this example is completely empty. It accepts uh, custom property, parses JavaScript, and evaluates it. So it's JavaScript for JavaScript for CSS, something like this. So should we consider that CSS is a programming language? Isn't it? OK, next part, important part uh, with which we send in our data to renderer is custom properties. And Houdini has a special uh, specification called properties and values. So basic CSS variable or more correct custom property, we declaring it and we using uh, our value we calling var function. What this function actually does, it takes custom property and extracts its value as a string. And what is the problem here? Uh, we also can override our custom properties on different levels. And interesting thing that this overrides uh, are not CSS based on CSS uh, uh, cascade, but on DOM. So the parent is actual DOM parent of the child element. So we can override it. And the last feature, we can provide a fallback value. Because this variable is just a string, it's possible that the value will be uh, wrong. So if the value is wrong or we have no value, we, we will use a fallback one. OK, so as I said, all these strings. And what is the problem here? Browser has completely no idea how to animate one string to another one, how to transition them. Uh, but instead of that, uh, browser already knows how to transition numbers, colors, and such kind of things. So could we be benefit from these uh, uh, possibilities from CSS Engine? And the answer is yes. We can use CSS types, uh, which I mentioned slightly before. So we can actually assign a type for our custom property using register property. In this uh, register property function, we are passing a special descriptor, which should contain uh, re uh, our custom property name, uh, the syntax, which means actual CSS type, like color, percentage, number. We have almost all of them covered right now, without only more advanced syntax for lists, arrays of data, but hopefully they will come in the next spec versions. Then we can uh, provide an initial value. If nothing will be specified, we will fall back to this initial value. And last one, inherits property, is uh, only performance optimization. As I said before, the custom property could be inherited through the DOM. But it has a performance drawback because engine needs to uh, define if the property was overridden and such kind of things. So we can switch off this feature completely if we are knowing what we are doing. And we will benefit from performance. OK. But shouldn't we declare the types of custom properties inside CSS, not in JavaScript? And hopefully, this feature will come in the next version of the specification. So for now, there is a proposal to use add property uh, rule to define custom property. We're using add property, calling the name, and then pretty similar uh, descriptor of the custom property, but with CSS syntax. So instead of camel case, we have this kebab case for initial value and such kind of things. But in general, it's the same. And actually, I 
created a small post CSS plugin that parses the syntax and create JavaScript declaration for you. So it will be easier to migrate from uh, the specification we have right now to the future one. Okay, and when we define in such types, we can, for example, animate them smoothly. For example, if you use them in gradients. So animated gradients come in, actually. That's pretty nice. Let's slightly speak about our main JavaScript that will update uh, and render, request the render of our animations or pictures. So first thing we need to do usually is the update of a custom property. And it's done pretty easily. We select in the element itself, go into its style, and set in the new value for property. If you want to use VASM, WebAssembly, and request new state from it, we should first of all write our WebAssembly code, load it, and then if it's continuous animation, we should start the render loop in which we are calling a new state from WebAssembly module, then updating custom property, and repeating our task again and again. And again, we have benefits in performance and sites with WebAssembly. WebAssembly is binary format. It should be small and should be performant and executed in separate thread. OK, let's speak more about WebAssembly and state management for renderers. So WASM is a binary instruction format for stat-based virtual machine in our browser. So usually the problem with compiled languages is that they, they are compiling for some specific platform like x86 or something like that. And browsers decided to solve this problem to provide some virtual machine to run binary code and try and this standardize. Right now, WebAssembly is a MVP. It's just first steps in uh, getting this real specification. But the interesting thing here is that all the vendors browser vendors are so interested in these features, so we're getting uh, all new specifications for WebAssembly implemented in browsers very soon. And it's really, really great. So what options do we have? For now, uh, most of options we have, the, uh, the languages that uh, come without uh, garbage collector. It's still not in WebAssembly spec, so usually it's languages with manual memory management, like C++, like Rust, or assembly script. Rust is pretty interesting, but the problem with it is that it has completely different paradigm comparing to JavaScript. So it will be hard to start with and get things done fast. C++ is a classic language. Maybe somebody learned it at the university and such kind of things, but also not the best option for front-enders. But assembly script that I'm most interested and excited uh, for uh, is a subset of TypeScript that compiles to WebAssembly. And the good thing is that it requires Almost no glue code to load it, no some uh, constructions to reformat memory or something like that. It follows the WebAssembly specification, so we have direct access, almost direct access to uh, WebAssembly memory management, for example, load some values or set some values to the memory and such kind of things. And the syntax itself pretty similar to TypeScript, but with a big, big differences. Why? Uh, first thing is that WebAssembly, for now at least, accepts only numbers. It has no idea about high-level data structures like objects, maps, sets, or even strings, 
or booleans. Everything just a number. For now, all these languages trying to recompile booleans, swings, and code them to numbers. So that is why in assembly script we have only numeric types, but not JavaScript just the number type, but more specific ones. Um, maybe somebody knows which uh, type used under the hood for JavaScript. It's actually 32-bit uh, floating point numbers. Even if we set the value to integer in the memory, it will be saved as floating point 30-bit number. Now, with the new specification, we have big int type, and it implements 46 uh, bits integer type. And in WebAssembly, we can choose between 8 bit, 16 bit, 32 bit, 64 bit numeric types, floats, and uh, integers, signed, unsigned, and so far, and so on. Uh, and also, assembly script will require you to write all your types explicitly because it needs to be compiled and all the types should be defined before the compilation. Another big difference working with assembly is a linear memory. What is linear memory? Uh, for simplicity, it could be described as just an array of bits. And to get or set some value, we need to know the offset inside this array and the size of the data we want to get. So for example, we're saying we want some variables starting at uh, second bit and it should has 8-bit length. That's how these things work. And this is the only mechanism how we can interact with the assembly and main thread code. So we should pass some numbers, and we will get some numbers. Then we decode them, interpret, and such kind of things. So what it could be used for? For example, this is called flocking algorithm. We have these bugs like Creatures, we render them using Paint API workflow on Canvas, and we have a bunch of properties to configure, how big the distances between them should be, how they should align, behave, such kind of things. And the state is updated on WebAssembly side using uh, assembly script compiled module. And it's quite performant. And it's hard to imagine what we can create else with that. And on top of that, you can run your React, Vue, or something else, or jQuery. Again, the concept I want to describe is a strict separation of concepts. So we're using Paint API workload for Vue layer, for rendering. We're using main JavaScript code to load paint worklet, to pull out WebAssembly, and to pass properties to the renderer. Then we're requesting state update from WebAssembly module, which is used for state management. And WebAssembly module calculates new state and returns results to the main thread. Then we're again updating custom properties, passing them to the renderer. Pretty simple and pretty nice and common thing. That's all that I have. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, follow my blog, and I want to mention that these awesome illustrations I get on Pixabay by uh, user CDD20. Unfortunately, I don't know his name. Thank you very much, and try the power of WebAssembly for your CSS crazy ideas. Thank you. Please welcome here. Okay, we will start with the questions. There are now not lots of them, but I think maybe we. Uh, for, uh, for example, the first question uh, that we have, 
Is it correct to compare JS plus CSS size with picture size? No, as I said, it's not completely correct because we have drawbacks with uh, parsing time and such kind of things and battery usage as well. So it's not direct comparison, but we can save users' data, trading off battery and time of parsing. Okay, second sub question. In the case of JS plus CSS, how much is the impact of compilation and so on? Uh, you mean assembly script, how time it takes to compile assembly script to WebAssembly module? We can uh, think uh, how we can think about okay. it. Okay, so basically yeah. it depends on the okay. size of code you're using, but it's not a big deal and they have custom compiler which optimized for that, so probably a few seconds. But it all depends on size of project and complexity. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what is the best way to debug JS and CSS? What to use? The best way to debug JS and CSS. Oh, yes, this one is slightly complicated because you don't have syntax highlight or things like that in uh, your browser tool. So actually, it's old style, like try and fix stuff for now. Yeah. Uh, interesting question. Would you help? Julia, make your demo even crazier. What for? Would you help Julia make your demo even crazier? Yeah, maybe. Why not? <laughs> She's spoken mostly about CSS shapes and such kind of things, but Paint Happy used Canvas, so if she can do some cool stuff with Canvas, why not? Okay. Uh, why did you choose WebAssembly? Why not vanilla JS, vanilla CSS? Uh, first of all, because I want to run code on separate thread to not uh, hurt main thread applications. And actually, it could be JavaScript, but run in uh, Web Worker, for example. Or we can use both. We can use Web Worker to load WebAssembly mo module, because actually, WebAssembly loading time also takes something, uh, WebAssembly parsing might take some time, so it might be combined. And the bottleneck right now is to transfer data and transferring it between both JavaScript and WebAssembly. So it is possible. I believe you should measure it in particular cases when it should have sense. So yeah. And can you recommend some good recept for delicious food? <laughs> <laughs> Why food? <laughs> uh, to be honest, I have not that much time right now to do cooking, but I don't know. Just old good Ukrainian borscht. I really miss it in Poland because the thing that they call in borscht is actually beetroot juice with some potato. No cabbage, no tomatoes, no beans, no meat. So it's not a borscht. Only my wife can do a proper one in Poland. Okay, thank you. Now you should uh, choose the best question. Okay, let it be this one about JavaScript and WebAssembly. Which one should I choose? Okay, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.